What we'd like to do is to give you an opportunity for 15 minutes as a group to reflect on the day and to do two things, or to, to come up with two things. And the two things are, as a group, to come up with two questions which you come up with collaboratively, which you would like to ask to the panel of experts who are still here. And those panel of experts, you know, thank you very much for giving up another Saturday. On, on, on our behalf, thanks for all this. Um, and when you come, so you'll need a writer, or somebody with a good memory, if you know what to write, and to come up with two questions, reflections on the day. And what Karen and I are going to be doing is we're going to be sort of wandering around. We're not going to be intervening in any of your discussions, but we're just going to have a listen to see if there's anything that comes out of a number of groups which seems to be a commonality, which won't necessarily be asked in the question session, and then we can ask that if it's appropriate. So your task for the next 10, 12 minutes is to have a chat about the day, your feelings about it, whether you, you know how useful you found it, and what you would particularly like to ask the uh, the, the panel of experts that are still here with us. So is that okay? Is that, have I explained that? Because I'm not usually very good at explaining things. Okay. Right. Let's start with, uh, with the table which is nearest to the, uh, to the panel. Yeah. And would, you, would you like to kick off for yeah. us? Thanks very much for the yeah. first question. Okay, so the first question is in two parts. Um, first That's part, two questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the question is what do you as a panel think about the current available information on identity online? And the second part of that question is how do we as patients help get Credible information that we hear today become more credible. So I'll kick off. I think there is a lot of rubbish online. I, if when patients ask me, and a lot of the forums around the UK do the same, is we direct you to the Leicester YouTube channel, and I would suggest looking at the IGA Nephropathy Foundation website because that has everything on that website has been peer reviewed. And so those are the two places that I would recommend patients go and find information. I'll give you an example. Chicken and I wrote a review article or an editorial about how we didn't believe that you should avoid gluten in your diet if you have IJ nephropathy. Within 24 hours, I saw a tweet from a healthcare store quoting me, saying I had said, you need to avoid gluten. <laughs> <laughs> and that this was the best thing ever. So says Professor, and it was complete opposite to what was said. So I do think it's really important to go to trusted resources. And those are the only two places I would look. The other place I think you could mention is Radar. Because Radar and Kidney Research UK have information about IGA, but other than that, and, and I think the other thing to say, and Sarah's in the room, for UK people, you need UK information. When I talk to patients in the US, a lot of the questions are not relevant because there's an issue of healthcare and how healthcare is provided. And so you can often get a, a take from another part of the country, or the world, where they're having their questions, you think, well, why are they asking this? And it's because the way they access healthcare is so very, very different. So I think you need UK answers for UK questions. I don't know, UK. Yeah, I, I was going to say those exact websites. I think Kidney Care UK also has extremely good information on their website, which again is uh, <coughs> uh, very accessible as well. And how can patients help? Well, if patients, so IGA is a disease of younger people. And anyone seeing me trying to na navigate how I could tweet out a picture yeah. will realise that it's not something that I'm used to. But if you can spread the word through your networks, you know, that this kind of event, these kind of resources exist, that spreads much better and has much more credibility than some old person like me saying this is what you should do. 
So I think peer-to-peer -peer support is really important. And do you have a second question about group or was that it? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, uh, what could we do to help fundraisers to accelerate stroke support? The great work that's happening here. Um, I always there British. Is, there I is hate a Just talk, Giving yeah. page. Yeah. There is a Just yeah. Giving page that um, we've put the link out on the uh, Facebook page previously, but we can do it again. Maybe Roisin can do it again sometime tonight. So that's that's one way of doing it. It's, it's it is. Possible. But being British, we never like to talk about money. <laughs> Although someone was very interested in how on earth do you fund us all. So we do like to have help. If you're interested, there is a guy. So Caroline, who's our research nurse manager, her son has cycled halfway around the world and is raising money for IJ nephropathy. So there's a great, ins what is it called? Is it Instagram? Just giving? No, there's a something he's done where he's posted videos of him cycling through Iraq and through various other countries that you would imagine you wouldn't want to cycle through, but he's cycled through them. And he's been raising money for IJ and property. So there are lots of things people can do, if you like. And the Just Giving page is a great page to, to do that through. Can I just add, yeah. if anybody is interested, I'd love to have a conversation with you about fundraising. So that's why Sarah's here. <laughs> so Sarah would love to have off light out of today. If you're happy to have a telephone call with Sarah, just to get your views on this, please will you say hello to Sarah before you go? And if you're happy to give her your contact details while she's here in the UK over the next 10 days, mm -hmm. she'll give you a call and just sit and chat to you about uh, what uh, about uh, raising money, donations, etc. Thank you. Are we going to uh, onto this table here. Who's, who's <coughs> asking the questions? It's two really good questions here. <laughs> How do we get up-to-date information on new treatments available to us? Well, I think, again, it's those websites that John mentioned before. I think it is, you know, the, the field is changing uh, really rapidly as well. Um, I know, John, you've got a Twitter uh, feed, haven't you, that you update regularly to, to, with that up-to-date information. Very slowly, but regularly. <laughs> uh, so I think, uh, you know, the, the trusted websites and, and those channels. And we try and use the Facebook page, but we're conscious that not everyone uses the IJ Nephropathy UK Facebook page. And it is really difficult because of confidentiality. We can't, there's no way we really can reach out to people and hold people's personal information because there's a whole series of governance issues around that. So it, it would be important for you guys to tell us how could we best communicate with you in the constraints with which we are allowed to know information about you. And is there a single place that would make sense? Some people hate Facebook. And I've said, you know, even if you go onto Facebook, you don't never need to post anything and you can appear as, you know, you can use your real name. If you just want to watch, that's great. But I just don't know how the easiest way is to communicate with everyone in a single way. If you've chosen to use the Facebook page, but if someone could come up with a better way, please just email and let us know. So GK's talk today will go on the Facebook page. So all that information about the tumor and it will go on the YouTube channel. Really interesting question here. How much research is being done to find IgA without doing a biopsy? How much do you want to take that um, So there's lots of research going into it. <coughs> And there's lots of people all over the world. We recently released, I think, two reviews in which we looked at all the different markers people had proposed that you could measure in the blood as potentially being a biomarker for hygienic property. Hundreds and hundreds of them. The problem is we haven't really verified that in more than one group. So if someone's found it, but no one else has tested it to see if it could be the case. So one of the things that I was talking to John about over the last few months, actually, was trying to find a way to streamline biomarker research across the world so that we can find certain markers that might be promising and they encourage labs everywhere to try and test it in their own populations to see if it works. There's a lot of work that goes into trying to make sure that this marker is something useful. Because what you don't want is for it to come up with lots of false positives and get people worried, for example, and then you might end up biopsying people that don't need it. And you also don't want it missing people that might actually have the disease and you know, not doing anything about it either. There's a bit of work that goes into it, but it's a priority for a lot of people, which is why so many people are looking into it.
And it's not just diagnosing, it's as soon as we've got the diagnosis, what can we do that ha tells us which drug you're going to get is the right one for you, how do we monitor that? So there's, as well as every clinical trial testing a new drug, everyone in those trials has been asked if they're prepared to give blood and urine during the trial, so we can do these kind of analyses that you're talking about. So we're going to have lots and lots of samples where we can look at that, but that's going to come over the next few years, not immediately, unfortunately. I think we are going to be moving into how do we combine the drugs that we've seen for the best way for the best patient in terms of what drug can we put together for an individual that are going to mean they avoid kidney failure in their lifetime. And I think we're now going to have lots of drugs to choose from. And how do we personalise that using blood and urine tests to make sure we don't waste time giving you a drug that was never going to work for you? So that's going to be a real focus. And of course, those things that Chike mentioned, those conditions that are unmet, people with low kidney function, people with transplant, children, people with IJ vasculitis. And what do you think? Yeah, no, I think so as well. I mean, I think, uh, so I'm, I'm quite interested in artificial intelligence and computing systems and the kind of power they afford. And you know, for anyone that saw the DSP, the, the work that I was showing you, it generates a huge amount of data. And one person can't go through all that data in, in the time that we have. So I think we're going to get a lot of support through computers. And there's a lot of new initiatives in which um, essentially artificial intelligence analyzes all these different genes that are switched on and off in various conditions and propose to us what the best targets for research would be. And I think there's a chance it can accelerate things because instead of us relying on ourselves to pick the right marker, we just get offered the sort of platter of different things we could test. So, so I, I think it'd be a good time to tell the audience um, what you've put forward to Kidney Research UK and to see what people think about this. Yeah, so I was going to, I mean, as a response to one of the questions you had about where, where do you get sensible information from? So I, I speaking to people with IGNFropathy in clinical trials, one of the things they like most about it is there's a chance to talk more and have your questions answered, your specific questions answered. Um, and it struck me that a lot of the things that I was saying, I was repeating because the information's there, but you just don't know where to get that information from. Um, or you and, don't trust it. Yeah, absolutely, exactly. Um, and so chat GPT enters the chat um, about, what was it, you know, early 2023 really. And I started thinking to myself, what if we take the infrastructure of chat GPT, but train it on literature specific to IGN nephropathy put together by a group of experts. So you're, you're cutting out anything that makes no sense. So you have this model that knows how to talk to you in a natural way using information that experts have given you. So what I'm kind of seeing for this, what I'm visualizing in my head is to begin with, it'll just be a chat where you can interact with and say, what is IGNFropathy? I have this in my blood, what does that mean? What are the new treatments? And it'll give you an answer in a very con you know, conversational way. But then going forward, someone else asked this question about how we can attract people from all ethnicities into research. The idea is that because it's text-based, we should be able to translate it into different languages and eventually get it talking as well. So I proposed that as, as a research project and I've applied for funding to Kidney Research UK to at least test how it would work in a pilot setting. I'm waiting to hear back from it. And I think I spoke to a few of you in the room actually about what you would think about that and I got some positive feedback from it. But if anyone else has any thoughts or you want to support it, just come speak to me and I'm, I'm happy to. So I, I can't show you this actual video but I w was filmed giving a talk, and I had to do a lot of this grab movement, like this. <laughs> and then they have made me speak in fluent Italian, German, Chinese, Dutch, and I've shown it, and you cannot tell it's not me speaking. They have synced my mouth movement with the language, and it is unreal in terms of you talking about languages but actually we are not that and there's some people who work in IT in the room here but that we it's frightening how close we are but how potentially that makes things more accessible of course the challenge is when I meet these people and they think I can speak to them <laughs> <laughs> but it is frightening how realistic it can look in terms of uh, giving information because it's really important to have that information in your own language isn't it yeah absolutely so everyone can have an AI-powered John sitting on their computer <laughs> answering the questions. <laughs> it's a nightmare. That's a horror movie. <laughs>
for another question. Uh, second question, we talked about um, the UK being a postcode lottery, and we said, is there a better way to transfer information from patients to GPs to nephrologists and have everybody understanding the same information and whether you live north, south, east, west? So for me, the most important person to hold the information is the patient, because you are the person it belongs to. So patient view or patient knows best, I think, is a fantastic way that you have the data on your phone. And actually, wherever you go, you can just open it up and show them and say, this is my results. Because you can't guarantee, even if you have blood taken in Kettering, which is 20 miles south of here, and you have blood taken in Leicester, the systems won't necessarily communicate with one another. But if you are able to access the results from Kettering in patient knows best, and in Leicester in patient knows best, you have it all in your fingertips. So the perfect scenario would be all the IT and the NHS talks to each other, but there are lots of information governance issues around sharing data without consent, and that's a real challenge. So the best way is for you to hold the information or have access to the information, I think. And I mean, you do a lot of big data, but it is all around information governance, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And I, and I think the, the solutions, I think, are probably going to make the problem worse. So it comes exactly as John said, having control of your own information is the key thing through things like patient knows best. So I know that different regions are coming up with their own apps for different conditions. And the idea is that the app centralizes all your clinic letters and GPs can see it, your specialists can see it. The problem is the heart failure team are doing it for heart failure, the diabetes team is doing it for diabetes and so on. So there's very possibly a world in which you'd have to have about 15 apps on your phone to make it work. So having a way that works well for you is really important. And I think everyone needs to think about what works best for them and then make it work. I was just going to add, I mean, regarding your covered postcode lottery uh, comment, I guess, um, you know, as nephrologists, we do, you know, talk to each other a lot. We have quite a uh, close kind of a community of people who are interested in, uh, you know, conditions like hygienophobia, I think when these new treatments start coming out, there will be lots of efforts to try and kind of uh, discuss how to best use these new treatments amongst the group as well. So I imagine that there will be this kind of increase in awareness and education around new treatments as well. But in terms of postcode lottery, we're a small country. If you go to the US, mm -hmm. there are people taking planes to go see their pathologist. So, you know, if there is an issue, then you, can, you, you just need to speak to your nephrologist and say, could you refer me to, or could, would you mind asking someone? Mm -hmm. And again, nephrologists will not mind that. And we will know someone locally who, will, we will, who we work with who will be very happy to do that. So again, it's all about the fact we are a small country. And actually traveling anywhere in the UK is relatively easy. So you know, there are the opportunities here. And with teams, I do a lot of consultations with people outside of Leicestershire on teams now. And uh, that's the first way. And if we want to take it further, we can meet face to face. But it's actually very easy to do that. So uh, this, this table, yeah. who's, who's your speaker? Yeah. Yeah. So we'd like to know, is the pain IGA patients report in their kidney area real or all in their head? So my guess is everyone's been told it's all in their head. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to Harish here because Harish is running a study exactly looking at this. It's a it's a big it's a big thing, and I think we all believe that it's very real, and we want to get to the bottom of it. And no one has looked into it. So all the textbooks describe this pain, and they say it's something that's there. But we have different databases for research. If you put in pain and eye nephropathy, nothing comes up. So we, we're, we're doing a study called the Anchor IJ Nephropathy Project in which we're trying to look into this. The first step is to do a survey. So you need to be on radar for this. So again, I know radar's come up multiple times in the day. If you have a chance to sign up, it will be great if you could and get patient knows best. So a survey will come through either patient knows best or through your radar email address. And that survey is all about loin pain, kidney pain in IJ Nephropathy. So that is going to start collecting the first bits of information on this, how many people it affects, how it affects you, what, what triggers are there. But critical is even people who don't get pain, it'll be very helpful if you answer that survey so we have something to compare it to. Our biggest worry is that everyone with pain is going to answer it and everyone without pain isn't going to. Um, so I encourage you to encourage everyone you know really to try and do it. Um, so that's the first part of it. The second part of it is that we have a very talented researcher who does interviews 
Um, so her name's Christina. So she'll be posting on the Facebook group. Um, and the idea is that she's going to be speaking to people that have pain to get to the details of, again, how the pain works. What we're trying to do at the end of all of this is work out how we can better manage that pain. And so we want to try and solve that problem. The last part of it is going to be a lab-based study in which we look at blood and urine to try and see which markers might be driving the pain. That's a little bit further down the road, but it's, it's, it's all in the plan, really. So um, I know this has already come up, this idea of how do we best communicate with you. And I think it's really important for us to know that. So maybe if, you're, if you can email us, that'll be great. But even on the papers you have in front of you, if you write down any ideas you have, we can have a look at it later on um, and try and find some way of getting all the information out to you. But I hope that answers yeah, the question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, this is regarding uh, uh, clinical trials uh, and all. Okay, so we get our blood test almost every third month. Okay, so the, why not to have consent from the patient in the first place when we get first diagnosed? Okay, that we'll be taking uh, additional, okay, we'll be using your result for uh, clinical trial. Because some of the research, most of the research, I would say, they can only ask for blood test and urine sample. Okay, so then these things can that be taken from patient nose back or, or like every team can we go for blood test and we'll have larger database for that? So we can only do research if we have approval from an ethics committee about the study we want to do. And then we need to take your consent to be allowed to study your samples. So what we have in Leicester is Justina who mm -hmm. is approaching every patient. So every patient I speak to in clinic, I'm asking if they're happy for Justina to give them a call. Mm -hmm. And then Justina will chat to the patient and say, look, we've got these studies. Are you able to come up and have some blood samples? I'll talk you through the studies, the research studies. Yeah. Because that's one aspect. The other aspect is clinical trials. And there, there's a very regulated process in terms of how we approach patients about clinical trials, how we give information how we make sure that you have enough time to think about it, and then we see you and talk about consent. So that's a very regulated side of things. But in Leicester, because this is what we're interested in, I ask your permission, because again, I cannot do anything without you saying it's okay to share your contact details. So when anyone, anyone emails me, or does anything, I need to be absolutely sure that you're happy for me to share your email address, your telephone number, your name, your address. And if you're happy to do that and you give me your consent, then Justina will make contact and say, when do you want to come up? And Justina, I mean, you run your diary from seven o'clock in the morning to whenever to fit around if people are available, they need to get in before work, they've got to drop the kids off, whatever, then we will be asking patients continually if they're happy to give us samples. And that goes for anyone in the room who's prepared to come up to Leicester. Um, we can't do it remotely for most of the things we do, but what we try and do is go through a process that's approved by an ethics committee because it has to be in terms of how we approach this and how we get your consent to be allowed to then ask you about research. Right, should we move on to this table? So, what's your first question? Well, I want to be breaking the math, so I'm going to ask one. Um, how will you provide education on IGA to small services such as GPs? GK. Um, well, I think, again, um, um, you know, as the new treatments come through and, and there are changes that we can make, there will be uh, outreach efforts made, um, you know, through a variety of different ways, face-to-face -face meetings, online webinars, and, you know, GPs have shown, again, great interest in, in finding out more about how to use these new treatments, for example, with you know, we've seen that with SGLT2 inhibitors in chronic kidney disease and that kind of wave of that medication. I'm sure the same will happen uh, with um, the new treatments now for, for IGN nephropathy. I think ultimately most patients with IGN nephropathy will be managed within kind of kidney clinics. So probably the focus will be within the kidney community itself, but there will be obviously close dialogue as well. Yeah, I mean, I think we've got to manage expectations. GPs are very busy. And they're like because they only have one person in their whole practice that's got IGA. So they can't be expected to be an expert. What they should be expected to do is to know they're not an expert mm -hmm. and to refer you to the expert. That's what I would say. A good GP, an excellent GP, knows what they don't know, 
and knows who to refer to for the diseases they don't know very much about. And I wouldn't expect a GP to be able to manage RGA nephropathy. I wouldn't expect a general hospital consultant to be able to manage RGA nephropathy. We do talks for general physicians in training. So this will be people going on to be gastroenterologists, cardiologists, respiratory physicians. And we start explaining what a UPCR is, a protein to creatinine ratio, which you all look at. Their eyes just glaze over. So you've got to understand, we become incredibly specialized very early on. Equally, I wouldn't know, you know, endoscopies and all that kind of gastro stuff. I accept I don't know. So you've got to just, the key thing is to get seen by someone who knows what they're doing. And that's the, that's the important thing. And not to be looked after by someone who doesn't know. Because that's the worry, is that they'll do inappropriate things. Do you want to do a second question? Yeah, I think we'll just do one. Okay, great. Right. Um, right, who's going to do your question? Yeah, So, the level of funding and research going into AIGA, some of which we've seen today, is that comparable to other similarly rare diseases? And if not, what's driving the focus on IGA, apart from the wonderful team, of course? I think. So if you think about how we're funded to do our work, it comes from really three sources. One source is donations. One source is we apply to funding bodies for money to do research. And the other is we work with the pharmaceutical industry. So we've been very fortunate because there's a lot of interest in IGN property therapies, and we are seen as the leading center in the world to do this, that they are doing a lot of work. With pharmaceutical industries, and we were very fortunate to have Mr. Mayer who gave us a large donation. But that is very unusual, and it's not going to last forever. So, we are continually looking at how we can raise money through all of these different routes to try and continue the work and think about how we use what we've learned in IJ nephropathy to help people with other forms of kidney disease. Because a lot of what we see is general, so the kind of technique that Harris showed you, that DSP work in the end lab. We're already starting to use that to look at different bits of the kidney that's affected in different types of kidney diseases. And that clearly opens up new opportunities. So I think we, funding is a continual challenge for any group in any disease trying to do research, because research is getting more and more expensive. So hazard a guess as to how much you think the machine that Harris was showing you cost. Yeah, so nearly 300,000. <laughs> and it's already out of date. There's something better. So just like you can buy a new Apple computer, you know sod's law, the minute you buy it, the next one is going to be coming along. So, you know, and we want to be able to answer the really important questions. So that's just one piece of kit. It's not the, the bits that we need to do an experiment, it's just having the piece of kit. So you can see the kind of money that we're talking about to be able to do the experiments that are really going to make a difference. And so that's where we're kind of looking at how we can generate those funds. Okay. Well, the second question, it was along a similar lines to the five-year question earlier, but a bit more specific. And one of the, the goals for everyone is to reduce or even eliminate dialysis before a transplant. Where do you think that, how do you think that goal may be achieved? Will it be through the medical trials and the medication? Will it be a massive increase in the availability of donors or will it be something completely new, like artificial kidneys, for example? GK. Um, well, I think obviously in the shorter term, probably you know the clinical trials that are happening at the moment are going to be key and, and look at uh, maybe one medication, maybe a combination of medications uh, in an individual. I think it really depends a bit on on where an individual is in, in their disease course as well. Um, you've also got the other treatments that John was talking about. But we know that we have to really, you know, slow the rate of kidney function decline significantly if we're going to avoid, uh, you know, dialysis in, in a lifetime, really. So there's not still lots of efforts to be made in the laboratories here and other laboratories around the world to try and you know find those new findings to be able to um, you know develop newer better drugs that are safe in the long term I think. And the other thing is we need to diagnose you earlier 
because most of the time this is a condition that you don't know you've got. And just by chance, you might have had a urine dipstick or you might have had a blood pressure check or you might have had a blood test. Probably not because of anything to do with the kidneys. And we pick you up by chance. And by the time we pick you up, there's already been some kidney damage. So we need to think how we could easily identify people either at risk of IgA or who have IgA in an early stage so we can intervene when you've got 80% of your filters still working. Because it's much easier to keep you off dialysis if we can start treatment when you've got 80% of your filters working than starting treatment when there's only 40% working. So we need to push back the time at which we can diagnose you. And for that, we need easy tests. Like you were saying, we don't want to be doing biopsies. We want to be doing an easy urine test or a blood test. So that's something that we are really actively looking at to see what we can do to get that diagnosis earlier. And that's part education. I don't know how many of you, when I see patients and we look at them, it's been known for some time you've got blood and protein in the water, but no one's actually acted on it. And that's very frustrating because if we'd acted on it and found it earlier, we'd have been able to do things a lot earlier. So it's about education, it's all about thinking how we can get that diagnosis earlier. And last two questions from this table. Um, so our, our first question was about flare-ups. So um, we talked a bit about where disease might have stabilised a little bit and then flares up the soft um, And sort of, a, a sort of a two or three questions, you know, what, what triggers it, what do you do to prevent it, and what's the best way to know that it's actually happening? So unlike kind of diseases like lupus, or other diseases where it's very obvious you're having a flare because your joints start hurting or you develop a new rash. In IgA, we're just not quite sure whether there are flares happening because the only thing we might notice is there's more blood and protein in the urine, but you don't see that, so you don't know it's happening. One of the things that we're going to do as part of Harris's study is if, are those episodes of loin discomfort, kidney pain, actually a flare? And that there's a temporary flare of inflammation in the kidneys leads to a death of a few of those filters, and then everything goes back to normal. Of course, at the moment, we put it down to, is it really the kidneys <laughs> or not? We don't take it that seriously. So part of the stuff that Harris is going to do is going to be look to see exactly what happens to see whether there are true flares or not. We just don't know the answer to that yet because we don't have an obvious thing that people complain about other than the loin pain. So it could be there are flares nibbling away at the nephrons, taking out a few of the filters each time that happens, and we're just not doing anything about it because it's just not obvious to us clinically that that's happening. So that's a work in progress. You just mentioned about the, um, the blood and the protein that you may not see. Is that, how often do you think you should that should be tested? How often? How often should you have that test? So that's a good question. We don't want people getting obsessed with dipping their urine three times a day. For me, I think I would be wanting, so depending on what your level of kidney function is like and how your IgA has been behaving, I would want to see how much protein is in your urine every two to three months on average. Some people I'd like to see it more frequently, some people I can wait a lot longer. So it will all depend on an individual basis. I don't think we can set a rule of thumb, but at least if you've got IgA nephropathy, anyone with IgA nephropathy should be having that looked at twice a year would be my view, along with their blood pressure, along with their kidney function. You know, what do you think, GK? Yeah, I, I agree. I think it really does depend on the individual and, and probably, you know, how the disease has uh, behaved in the past, because we do know that the disease is extremely variable as well. So I think I would use that as a kind of a gauge and a, a track record about how to monitor uh, going forward. Um, you know, certainly if there's been any changes in and other things like your medications that are that I might want to monitor more frequently at that point. I think you talked about flare-ups and certainly there are links with infections and I'm sure there's many perhaps in the room who've had you know seeing episodes of blood and, and the urine when, when they've been unwell or flare up that way. But um again it, that doesn't happen to everybody so um um yeah and, and it's obviously quite difficult to avoid uh, those uh, infections sometimes as well. Yeah. Is there, of the you mentioned earlier today about the link with the respiratory system. Mm. Is, it, is, it, is there a link between infections of the respiratory system, etc., and 
parents. Yeah, I think that's a well-known link. Uh, it doesn't affect everybody, but um, you know, typically if, if uh, a, a person might get a, a upper respiratory tract infection like a cough or cold, and then and two weeks later uh, see some blood in the urine for, that lasts a few days and then disappears. Um, we don't think the you know we, we don't think that has significant effects in the long term if it's if it's, if it's very short and self-limited, uh, but certainly uh, that is a, a phenomenon that we do see. And, uh, and again, we've seen it more recently with, for example, vaccinations as well. We've seen that as well. Do you have another question? Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, right. Three parts that one, sorry. Okay. Our, our final question is, if, if the patient only has one kidney, um, does that mean that the kidney could potentially degrade faster just because there's more concentration on one kidney? Um, would you expect our to be more aggressive or not because they've only got one? I think you are starting off with with you know one kidney compared to two, so so potentially, you know, um, uh, the disease could um, progress more quickly, uh, but it does depend on how quickly that disease is, is occurring as well. Um, you know, IgA probably does tend to be this more slowly progressive disease, or, or with some people it doesn't progress at all. Um, so um, uh, I guess it does depend on that individual. Uh, case really, and others with two kidneys can have a very quick talk. So, um, um, yeah, I mean, you end up on dialysis because you don't have enough filtration units, and if you're starting off with half the number of filtration units as everyone else, that increases the risk. It doesn't mean it's absolutely going to happen, but on the balance of probabilities, if you started off with two kidneys full of nephrons and filtration units, that's a different situation to starting off with only one kidney with just those filtration units. But nothing is inevitable. That's the important thing. Okay, just one last question. Anybody else? Oh, yeah. You're talking about one kidney, and then you're talking about transplant patients, aren't you? Um, do you see a more, if IGA does come back in the transplanted kidney, in your experience, does it degrade? Does the disease progress faster? So, the disease coming back in a transplant kidney normally occurs in a very similar time frame to the way the disease developed originally. originally. And so most people may only think they've had IgA nephropathy for two or three years because that's the time from the biopsy till perhaps they develop kidney failure. But they've had that disease for a lot longer. It's not just suddenly appeared. The likelihood is most people have had IgA nephropathy for 10, 15, 20 years before they develop kidney failure. They just didn't know about it. So what we know, the beauty of plumbing in a new kidney, is we know from day one there was no IgA, and we monitor you very, very closely because of the risk of rejection, et cetera. So we will pick up changes much earlier than we would ever have picked up in your normal kidneys because we didn't know you were at risk of kidney disease at that point. So there's much more opportunity to intervene, and the likelihood is we will see IgA deposition occur, but that may take a long time to translate through to damage to the filters, just because that's what would have happened in your normal kidneys. You just didn't know it was happening at the time, but we can see that in real time, because you're under our nose, because we never discharge someone with a kidney transplant. We are looking after you for the rest of your life. And so we will follow you and see that. Okay, great. So um, thank you for all those really, really interesting questions that we could never of put into the meeting because you know because you came up with them as groups and I think that was a really really good discussion. Um, now I'd like to um, thank thank yous for today. I'd like to thank the people who did uh, I think the people who did the presentations and the people who did the, uh, presentations in the lab and the pre presentations in the talks and uh, answered your questions last.